So now we're going to take a little bit of a transition. Before we talked about some of the technological foundations of the course, the programming language Python. But now we're going to shift gears and talk about the mathematical foundations of the course, which is probability. One thing that I want to talk about before we get too deep in this is why are we talking about probability in the first place? A reasonable definition of data science is how to extract probabilities from data. Probabilities are the language which we use to communicate our certainty, our confidence in the predictions that we make about the world, or the confidence about the information that we've extracted from data. Well, much of what we talk about in the data science class will be about algorithms that we're using to extract probabilities. The very first thing that we need to do is to understand what a probability is and how to manipulate those probabilities. So, given how important probabilities are to data science, it's really important that you pay attention to this. It will be the foundation for much of what happens in the rest of the course. The goal of this section of the class is to teach you what a probability distribution is, how to marginalize a probability distribution, how to understand what it means to have a joint distribution, and also to compute functions on probability distributions like expectations and entropy. The reason that we're talking about probabilities is that the data we see in the world are variables, and these variables are uncertain. We don't know with 100% certainty what the value of a particular data we observe in the world is, and we use probabilities to encode this uncertainty. The flip side of uncertainty is confidence, and we use probabilities to encode how confident we are in predictions we make about what's going to happen in the future, or make predictions about what the value of some unknown variable is. So, for example, when we are trying to combine poles together, each of those poles are some measurement trying to understand what's going on in the world. They have some intrinsic uncertainty in them when we combine them together to create a final prediction of what we think is going to happen in the election, or whatever else. We need to use the mathematics of probabilities to combine those together in a reasonable way. So the definitions and the operations that we talk about today will be important for the rest of this class and understanding what it means to extract knowledge and useful information from the data outside the world and communicate that using the language of probabilities. So we're going to begin our discussion of probabilities with random variables and events. Probability is a mathematical language for describing random variables. And a random variable is just an outcome of some probabilistic event. Now many things in the world we don't think of as probabilistic events, but they really are. So for example, tomorrow's temperature is a random event. The weather is some probabilistic process, and the temperature we experience on a given day is a random variable. If you have a bunch of people and you randomly pick someone out of that, that is a random variable. And sometimes we even stretch uh, what we think of as a random variable because it's useful from a modeling perspective. So the temperature on a particular day in history is not a probabilistic event. It's already happened. We know with certainty what it was up to the measurement of capabilities of the thermometers at the time. But it's often useful to think about it as a random variable. Similarly, if we look at, say, how many times the word streetlight appears in some document, and we model that as a random variable, that is computationally attractive. So random variables are drawn from some sample space. And this sample space can either be discrete or continuous. We talked about this at the very beginning of the class when we talked about the kinds of data that we're working with, and this is where it comes in. A continuous random variable, for example, takes on all possible real values from negative infinity to positive infinity. Whereas a discrete outcome set just takes on one of a small number of separate values. And each of these different values are called outcomes. So we have a large outcome space, and each of the possible outcomes are possible realizations of our random variable. So let's first talk about discrete probability spaces. So let's take a very common example of discrete probability spaces, a coin flip. When you flip a coin, that is a probabilistic event, and there are two possible outcomes. You can either get a head or you can get a tail. 
And each of these outcomes have probability one-half. Or at least that's the way that a fair coin has to operate. But you could have an unfair coin where one side had a higher probability than the other. So this is a useful way of talking about some of the properties that all probability distributions have to obey. So first, a probability distribution has to sum to one. That is, if you flip a coin, one of two things is going to happen. That is, you can't have any space left over in the probability outcome distribution that is not accounted for. Another property of a probability distribution is that the probabilities have to be greater than or equal to zero. Now, a probability could be zero. That means that an outcome just is impossible. It's not going to happen. But it certainly can't be negative. A corollary of these two facts means that if you want to compute probabilities over a group of outcomes that are disjoint, and you want to know the probability of that group of outcomes, so for example, suppose that you're rolling a die, and you want to know the probability of the outcome being greater than 3, you take the individual outcomes for 4, 5, and 6, take the probabilities of those outcomes, add them together, and then you get the probability for the roll of a die being greater than 3. So let's talk a little bit more about the notation here. We are going to say that a probability distribution has to sum to 1. Hopefully you recall that the capital sigma Greek character is used to sum probabilities. We will use the lowercase x to denote a particular outcome, and that goes below the sigma to show that we're going to sum over all of the outcomes in the event space. And so we're then going to take the probabilities of each of the events, that's encoded inside the probability of p of x equals x. This is a lot like the for loop that we talked about last time in the context of programming languages. We're going to go over each of the possible outcomes, add them all together, and a property of probabilistic event spaces is that all of those probabilities have to sum to 1. When we talk about events, events are a set of outcomes to which we want to assign some probability. And often we describe these events in word form. So for example, we can say, drawing a black card from a deck of cards. That is one possible event from a probabilistic outcome. Drawing a king of hearts is another probabilistic event. And often we will want to compute the probabilities of these events. To compute these probabilities, we will need to use operations on events. Two of the possible operations that we'll talk about are intersections and unions. So an intersection is when you take two different things and you want both of them to be true. So for example, if we talk about drawing a red king, that is the intersection of two events, drawing a king and drawing a red card. We want both of those things to be true. We will signify that using this upside-down U character to signify the intersection of those two events. The other common operation that we'll talk about is the union. And so the union is you take two events and either one of them could be true. So for example, if you draw a spade or a king, we don't want both of those to be true, a king of spades. We want a card that is either a king or a spade. And so to compute that union, so to compute that probability, we take the probability of drawing a spade, the probability of drawing a king, and we subtract out the intersection. Because if we don't subtract out the intersection, we have double counted, because you do have some cards that are both kings and spades. It's helpful for some people to visualize what it means when we talk about operations on events. So let's take a look at what happens when we take the intersection of two events. So let's say that we have two events, a and B. And if we take the intersection of them, this is where both A is true and B is true. So that is the shaded intersection between those two. It is largest when A and B have a lot of overlap. And it is the largest size when A and B are exactly the same. However, if you take a union, you are adding those two things together. And the union of two things is largest when A and B have no overlap, because you always subtract out their intersection. Thus far, we've been talking about distributions of a single random variable. But 
Random variables often work together, but we often work with joint distributions. And joint distributions are distributions over multiple random variables. So, for example, think about flipping four different coins. Each of the coins can be either heads or tails. And if we think about the joint distribution over each of those four individual random events, those contribute to one of 16 possible joint events because each coin can be heads or tails, and so that's 2, 4, 8, 16. And in fact, you can think about this as a really big random variable with 16 possible values. So now that we've introduced joint distributions, next we'll talk about some of the operations that we can apply on joint distributions to transform them into different distributions.